This is Ryan Pierce, host of Completely Serious. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Hey, it's Baxter Colburn here from Public House Media. Did you know that we just added a store here at Public House Media? No, I'm not talking about a grocery store where you can go buy apples or bananas or peanut butter, which are all fantastic, especially when peanut butter's on all of those. Anyway, we've added a store here at Public House Media so you can not only come and represent your favorite podcast network, but also represent your favorite shows as well, too. Just go over to phmedia.com. And look in the top right corner where you'll see the the button that says store. Click on that and you can search through all of our great products. Or if you go to our Facebook page, Public House Media, you can see on the left-hand side a tab that says store. All of our products are listed there as well, too. It's the new Public House Media store. You don't want to miss it. It is fantastic. Buy some of that great swag to support your favorite shows and to support Public House Media. Check it out today. This is Sam Kirby, host of Cinema Stories here on Public House Media. Thank you for tuning in to the following broadcast here on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Cinema Stories, where we talk about movie and TV news and reviews, and maybe, just maybe, we'll learn a little something about ourselves. If not, then maybe I made you laugh a couple of times. I don't know. New episodes air bi-weekly on Tuesdays. Thanks again for checking out the totally spectacular following broadcast here on Public House Media. Welcome to How to Write Good. I am your host, Daniel Poppy. Find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. Check out How to Write Good on Facebook. This podcast is brought to you by Public House Media. Uh, This is a regular week again. We just finished up with Obsession. We talked about fandoms last week, and I did uh, for three weeks. So now I'm starting something else, and I I have a feeling that this topic is going to take at least two weeks as well, which I don't really mind the longer topics. Um... I hope that I don't repeat myself too much when I'm talking about these things, but you never know. And we're going to actually, we're going to jump into our word of the week. I think this is a useful word of the week. And and I think it's a necessity that we have a word of the week because you can't talk unless you have more than five words to talk with. So the word of the week, what do I have written down here? Oh, okay. The word of the week is errant. So A-R-R-A-N-T. And I think this is an interesting word. It means being notoriously without moderation. So yeah, use that in your regular day speak. Speech, speak, something like that. So we are going to be writing about, we're going to be talking about, excuse me, we are going to be talking about how my writing goes in circles. Uh, specifically how to write, okay? Uh, A deeper look at the act of writing, if you will. And uh, because I have to do this, I've done this before, we're going to take a little trip back in time to writing, to your... I've talked about my middle school, my elementary school, my grade school experience. We're going to be taking a trip back in time to your uh, mi- grade, middle, and element, uh, high school experience with writing, okay? So if you think, so you'll actually have to participate in this podcast a little bit. It won't take a lot. Don't worry. It's not a lot of work. You'll just get to listen to me. It won't, it's, it's not going to ha- be a lot of effort on your part. So uh, if you think back to English class or writing class, uh, think back to, think back to those classes or any class where you are taught how to write, Okay. So, and I, and I use taught how to write loosely. I'm putting quotation marks around those and putting them in quotes because I don't actually think, hint, hint, that people were actually taught how to write, okay? Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that, of course. Now, you are taught grammatical rules in those uh, courses, I'm assuming, and you're probably taught grammatical rules right up front. That's what happened for me in high school. I was taught grammatical rules in English class, freshman year, and I don't think we ever went through anything ever again that was grammar related, which I kind of wish we did because I didn't really need anything else we went through except grammar. I don't really care about all the literature we went through. I mean, it's interesting, but nobody actually cares about literature class in schools, do they? Unless they like literature. If you like literature, it's kind of a break from the rest of school. But 
I mean, you really don't need it. Let's just be honest. I don't think you need it. You don't think you need it. And even if you don't, if you disagree with me about that, you still don't think that you need it. All right, so you were taught grammatical rules at some point. You were taught, taught how to spell. You learned about literature, as I just talked about before. Uh, you wrote essays. I wrote essays. Uh, you wrote um, persuasive essays, maybe even stories. I know that we wrote stories at some point when I was growing up, okay? Now, within my experience as a student of English, because that's the language I speak, therefore that's the language I'm writing in, right? That's the language I'm talking in. Uh, I was taught, I was given formats to use for writing. By the way, those formats were u useless, except once I got to college. So I learned in high school, and I'm not trying to bash my English teacher, we had persuasive essays, and he gave us a specific format to follow for a persuasive essay. And um, after I got through college, getting through college, I'm never going to use that format again, because that's not how you persuade someone. That's not how it should, you don't need a format, you need logic to persuade someone, FYI. Uh, so we learned formats. I learned multiple different formats for multiple different types of things. And so they presented formats to me, and, but I was never given ex a, a clear explanation. I am feeling. I feel as if I'm saying that wrong. It's, it was never explained how to write well to me. All right. And some of you may be thinking, well, it was explained how to write well to me. And I think that's really good. But I think that once I get through explaining what was described as writing well or how you get to the point of writing well, uh, I think that you'll probably realize that you were never actually, that you really don't have a grasp on what makes good writing. And you can't, you can't teach somebody how to write well um, unless they know what good writing is. Does that make sense? So if you have a kid, and this, this kind of sounds counterintuitive because what's the point of teaching a kid if they already know what good writing is? And what's the point of teaching a kid if they can't understand it unless they um, understand what good writing is? All right, because a kid who doesn't know what good writing is isn't going to understand it. And a kid who does know what good writing is doesn't need to be taught it. All right. And there's a reason for that. Um, so I, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure as we go back to this, I'm sure there's nobody who actually explained to you how to create good writing and be consistently good at creating good writing. Do a consistently good, consistent job of creating good writing. Even with myself, when I was growing up, I kind of shot in the dark and people were like, oh, you're a good writer. And honestly, I think that I put in enough time where I, I hope I am. Otherwise, I should probably get a new podcast. Uh, people told me I'm a good writer, but they never, they maybe have maybe gave me information about specific things that made me a good writer, but they never actually um, explained what makes good writing versus what makes bad writing, okay? Um, in the abstract, and I think that's really where you have to lie, lay, I'm not even sure what I'm supposed to be using in that situation. I, I think that's where you have to sit. <laughs> we'll use that. I think that's that's where you have to sit. That's where you, what you have to think about to actually come up with good writing and come up with good writing consistently and this isn't even just a, a school thing now some of you may be being like well your school sucked i have to take a little break to talk about schools some people may think dan your school really sucked because all the rest of the schools are actually teaching kids how to write they're giving them a basis for how to write well and they're doing just fine with their writing which i doubt that kids aren't doing fine with their writing so i think they are probably doing fine with their writing uh, and it's likely due to the fact that they do tons and tons of writing. But I go into a lot of English classes, okay? A lot of different English classes. And all I see are formats. All I see are strategies for good writing, but no explanation of what good writing actually is. Because how am I going to hit a target if I don't even know what it is, right? If um, How am I going to hit a target if I don't know where it is? That's kind of the the analogy, the, um, the picture I'm trying to paint for you to help you understand what I mean. So if, if you are, uh, if you're like, Oh, if you say these are ways you can get to good writing, but you never explicitly state, this is what good writing is like at its core, it's going to be a lot harder. And there are going to be kids. And I would say that I was one of the, those kids who understand what good writing is because they've seen it a lot and they may not necessarily know how to know how to define it it's kind of like this the old saying with pornography there's i don't know i think it was someone in uh politics and they're like i don't know how to define pornography but i know it when i see it that's kind of how people who understand good writing 
function. They say, I don't know how to define good writing, but I understand it when I see it, okay? So what I'm trying to do is bring a delineate good writing to say this is the essence of good writing, and this is gonna help your writing so much more than any strategy or anything else that is presented, all right? And we're gonna get to that answer of what's gonna help your writing, but I have to go around. I have to take a lo the long trip around the house to actually get to that, okay? Because that's just how I work. And in the end, I'm not trying to actually give you advice on how to write well. I'm just trying to give you advice on how to write good, something good. Um, and that requires me to think abstractly. That requires me to present something to you that's abstract rather than something that is just practical. So I hope this helps. I hope this helps practically, but I also hope it helps abstractly as well. So uh, the thing about it, this is what gets me. The thing about it is if you hear professional writers, if you uh, look at what writers say about writing, what they always say, and I I guess I would, I think this is a part of becoming a good writer, but it doesn't define what good writing is at all. They always say, oh, the best way to learn how to write is just to do it, right? So essentially people are uh, to read. They'd say to read and then you actually have to write to write. Uh, so I misspoke there. So the best way to learn how to write, if you're going to be a good writer, you have to read. And uh, this kind of gets me to a problem because what if no one actually is writing well that you get to read? So if you're not reading good writing and you don't know what good writing is, then you don't have anything to, to show the difference between good writing and bad writing or um, contrast and compare your own writing to that to see how you line up and how good or bad you are, if that makes sense. So uh, you don't know what it is in the first place. You may pick up a book that stinks and you may say, oh, this is good writing, even though it's just horrible writing. So yeah, so you may not, if you can't actually, if you don't know what the thing is, you're never going to be able to, to determine whether something is good or bad with any definitiveness. We're trying to give, we're trying to give definity to writing. I don't think definity is a word, but it is now. Um, so what about writing workshops where it shows a story or, or a way to do something? I think that, uh, well, I'm talking specifically about school writing workshops. What teachers often do is they show a kid something, they give them, a, them a, an example of something and they're like, okay, this is what this thing is. Um, and this is an example of good writing. Now you take what you have from this and you go and you do it yourself. The issue with this is the issue of not defining your terms. And this is just going in big circles, which kind of makes sense because that's what this podcast episode is about. Um, now, when you when I was in logic class, uh, my professor would always ask, okay, what is this thing? And people would bring up examples. He's like, hey, an example is not a definition. You have to define the thing. Don't just give me examples. All right, so the teacher is giving examples which may help the kid understand something, but the teacher is never defining the thing. So instead of actually getting to the heart of what that thing is, the kid is kind of beating around the bush about the thing. The kid is walking around the count, the edge of it. Um, there's a term, and I think I brought it up in here. Now, if you if you think of the word apprehend, so when you apprehend something, it's where you understand it in part. And when you comprehend something, it's it's where you understand it fully. And we are apprehending writing at this point. And kids are apprehending writing at this point. And even how uh, professional authors are talking about writing, they're apprehending writing. They're not comprehending what it is. They're apprehending good writing. Excuse me. So we're, we're essentially left to stumble forward with a gut feeling to assess our own writing. All right. And if you know that something is good writing or you can if you have the um, mental capabilities to look at something and be like, that's good writing. And maybe you don't know completely why, but you know that it is good writing, then you're golden because you can look at your own writing and you can say, all right, that's bad writing. I need to change this to be good. Uh, and then if, if but if you uh, don't have the capacity to look at your own writing and say that's good writing or determine what good writing is. So some people have a difficult time. Uh, it, the There's a disconnect. There's a disconnect in the thoughts. So I've seen this with ki kids a lot. And I talk about kids a lot because I work with a lot of kids uh, where they they'll, you'll be talking to them about something uh, related to a concept and it just won't click. And you're trying to figure out a way for it to click. And what I am trying to do is essentially uh, tell them what that is or tell you what that is so that it clicks faster. All right. But um, the whole process of just stumbling forward, the whole process of stumbling forward to figure out what good writing is, is really arbitrary in my opinion, and I don't like it. 
So we are going to look into what I believe good writing is, as I've already stated, 15,000 times already. And uh, from a more philosophical perspective, which I already stated two or three times already. And hopefully, this is my hope. So if you aren't someone who writes tons, my if you are someone who is like, I'm, I'm pretty good at writing, I hope this improves your writing. And I hope it changes how you write because I think it's going to improve your writing. And again, this is from the abstract. And I've, I've said this before. I think thinking about things in the abstract stract actually affects things in the practical, if that makes sense. So the practical is the day-to-day. I'm actually trying to make something work here. The abstract is just the thoughts associated with it. So if I can understand the world more clearly, if I can understand writing more clearly, if I can understand what makes something good writing more clearly, uh, I'm not trying to... Now, when I think of writing, uh, so when you when you think of existential philosophers or typically they're, they're very... They they talk about things in a very almost spiritual way, it seems, if you if you read some of them. I would say not all of them do, but it comes across as Zen almost. And uh I'm not trying to to create a to do checklist for you to be a good writer. I think that there's an aspect to the human experience that goes beyond just the checklist of doing good writing that is very um human for lack of a better term that allows you to do something you can understand it on a very human logical level maybe something that is uh it's within logic you don't have to like you can understand it logically but it's not something that you have to you don't have to have a procedure for it right you can create your own procedure for it there's enough there's enough leeway in the human experience within the act of writing within the act of thinking to allow for someone to make their own way about it and do it in a way that's very expressive and very creative i just i just it just felt like i was just going off and talking about whatever right there but i hope it makes made that made sense so as a kid uh when i wrote i thought complexity was key all right that's how i thought excuse me and uh why did i think this all right when I when I was a kid, when you look at something as an as a kid, you see it as more complex because you're simpler, and that's why I thought complexity was the key to good writing. Okay, uh, you see it as more complex because the people who are writing it are more complex than you because they're adults; they think on a deeper level, and uh, to a certain degree, it is more complex. But I I understood this complexity to be to be convolution, if that's a word. And uh, the complexity was a little different, and I'll get to that as we talk about this. So I shifted my senior year of high school. In my senior year of high school, I shifted, uh, and I was influenced in specific ways uh, by specific people that that uh, that brings me the, to the perspective I am now. Okay, and and my perspective now is that. Well, I'll get to my perspective now, actually, and uh, these relate to things beyond. Um, beyond writing, actually. So they, they relate to um, difficulties I've had in my own writing. They relate to music and they relate to art. And so I'm going to be talking about um, most of those. I'm probably not going to be talking about the difficulties I've had in my life, but they, but the things that I uh, took in, so the music and the art especially, I'm going to be talking about. And I think that as I talk about it, you'll probably begin to understand what I think a writing is and how I define it. So at the end of high school, I had probably the worst period of my life um, to date. I'm expecting worst periods. And to deal with that period, I wrote about it. All right. Uh, I began also during a period I had, I started to have a greater appreciation for art and especially the meaning behind, behind art. And I started listening to uh, progressive rock. Okay. So we're going to actually talk specifically, we're going to connect writing and progressive rock first. Sound good? So if you don't don't know what progressive rock is, I want to give you a quick overview. So progressive rock, the the simplest way to define it is when you write progressive rock, the whole album is centered around one single idea. All right, uh, bands. So really famous progressive rock bands are Pink Floyd, Rush. Um, more modern is the Mars Volta. I think they have the Mars the the uh, article in front of it. There's Kansas, Spock's Beard. But one particular 
a band a friend introduced me to that I really got into because of the stuff going on in my life because I was just trying to find a way to connect to other people and and the music that was presented allowed me to connect to the ideas that were being presented allowed me to connect to other people or at least the people writing the music uh it was there was the band called Dream Theater and and um they actually there's a specific album that they make so again as i stated progressive rock has one single idea encapsulated in an album and some progressive rock bands have ideas that are strung along different albums so one one album isn't just separate it's a whole body of work which i i probably talked about in this in the past but i think it's the case that it's better to have ideas and pieces of art connected to other pieces of art because it goes it gives a fuller picture of what's trying to be communicated but let's get into this this uh, album so this album's called octavarium it is a, an album based on the octave and uh, i can't give you what the octave is right now because i don't have a piano in front of me but it's essentially the do re mi fa so la ti do except i'm not actually giving you the notes and singing them all right uh so this is the eighth album and it's talking about going in cycles and repeating uh the band essentially felt like they were starting over from where they were at the beginning and uh, it's chock full of references to other artwork but it all centers around uh this whole entire album centers around the central idea which is the octave as i say it in anything that is cyclical and anything related to the octave all right um and i i think that for me, that was really interesting because I never ran into something so complex before, um, or I didn't realize things were so complex, all right? Now, the funny thing about this album is that it only deals with one big idea. There are certainly a lot of other ideas that connect to this album. There's a lot of ideas within the album the band members present, but there's a central idea that they're going back to, and they're always going back to the idea that they're going in circles, right? And uh, I still actually, I think that the idea of going in circles is a very interesting idea as it relates to art, as it relates to life, as it relates to writing and being creative in general and having that circ, uh, the circles going on in there. Okay, so Octavarium is, is an album that did that and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is really cool. Never saw this before. Uh, they also... Um, essentially they were taking a really simple idea and they were expanding it as much as possible. So uh, I think of this like the there's the there's a parable, I don't know what you'd call it, a story, a fable about blind men. There's a, like eight blind men and they go up to an elephant elephant and most people have probably heard, heard this before. They go up to an elephant elephant ele, elephant elephant uh, and they, they each touch a part of the elephant and they each describe the elephant in a different way. And they're like, oh, an elephant is like a snake because the tail of an elephant isn't very big. And they're like, oh, an elephant is like a tree or an elephant is like a wall or anything like that. And uh, it goes back to that idea of apprehending. So you're not understanding something fully. The blind men are apprehending the elephant. They're not comprehending the elephant. And what uh, the band members do in Octavarium is they think about this idea of the octave. And they expanded to anything related to that idea because these, the idea of an octave, an idea of a circle, they're not the same idea, but they are related because uh, there's a circular aspect of music. It goes around in circles over and over again. It's always the same. Uh, there's, there's 12 tones in music. There's 16, there's eight notes in music. There's eight notes in an octave. And if I'm wrong, you can tell me. But the circle, it's going around in a circle musically. They're going around in a circle. Their lives are repeating it. And a lot of things repeat in this thing. Okay. Now let's jump over to art because I'm going to be connecting all this later. So art class, there's a specific thing. And I brought this up before. Uh, I took some art classes and I, I think that I, I would have really liked taking more. I really like art. I think it's really cool. Um, now, when things are created in art, and you don't see this very often unless you actually, um, if you actually, what am I trying to say? If you if you look at the different pieces of an artist, you don't just look at one piece. Uh, you see things that repeat, or you see things that are done over and over again. One one artist that does this is Monet. He, he'll like make the same exact haystack, and he ha and, and even if it's not necessarily the same thing repeated, there's a similar idea. So. Um, if you look at 
Van Gogh's art. I was just talking about Van Gogh to a friend of mine, so he's on my mind. If you look at his drawings, he'll draw just ordinary people working out in the fields, and this is a lot of stuff he draws. Most of the stuff he draws is just regular people who are working, and that's uh, that's the same idea being repeated in his thing. Now, within... Now, within uh, art, we call this a motif, and you can call this a motif in music as well. But within art, this is called a motif. This is something repeated again and again. And I made the case in my episode about themes that you should just, a theme in literature should just be a motif, something repeated because it gets too convoluted. But we're not talking about that right now. Uh, so, motifs are really cool in art because they do the same exact thing that uh that idea of the circle or the idea of the octave does in that album octavarium which if you want to listen to octavarium you probably won't like it there's some of you who will so if you listen to like uh heavy metal if you listen to if you listen to i mean if you know what progressive rock is you might enjoy it not everyone does but if you if you listen to anything heavier uh with a lot of guitar in it you'll probably like octavarium but most people probably won't there's there's a they have quite a big fan base, though, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But going back to this motif, so if you apply that to Octavarium, the circle is a motif in there. Uh, the octave is a motif. Uh, in art, if you apply that to me talking about Van Gogh, Van Gogh, always drawing, and I'm not talking about his paintings, but his drawings, uh, Van Gogh drawing, almost always drawing people, regular people working out in fields or doing something outside is a motif in his art. And uh, with motifs, the same as with music, is uh, there we're circling around that motif. We're putting that motif in different contexts. And uh, we're seeing it from different perspectives, which is kind of the goal of having that there. We're not just trying to do the same thing with it. We're trying to do different things with it. I, I brought this up before, and it's stupid. Uh, there was a game that had um and i think the skateboarder actually voiced him but it was a skateboarding game and the skateboarder uh there's a skateboarder named ronnie mullen who essentially created tons of tricks that were he essentially created skateboarding in a lot of ways um, so many of the tricks that you do in skateboarding were created by him and um if you're a skateboarder and what he in this game said he's like okay like you're you're doing something there's this this grind rail there's this rail that you can grind on where you jump on with your board and you it's kind of hard to describe unless you see it but uh he's like this has been done a thousand times there's been tons of people who've gone down here they've done, done tr tons of tricks on this and uh, what you need to do is you need to do something different so with this motif going back to this idea of motifs is the motif is there and we're trying to do different things with that motif to better understand the concept that is within it all right so how does this have to do with writing and some of you have already probably guessed it uh, writing is a string of thought so within music there's a lot of layers within art there's even more than one layer what people don't realize with writing is that it's a string of thought that relies on you to be able to remember it to be what it is and i guess that most art relies on you to remember it or comprehend it in some way or apprehend it in some way i guess uh it exists as one word at a time and it it builds one word at a time, all right? Uh, music, like I said, they have music and art, regular, have have regular, man. As I stated before, just going back to it, music, traditional art, have multiple layers going on at once. And I think this is fairly clear. If you can, if you can, um, if you can sense, if you can see multiple things at once, I don't just see one dot of paint when I see something with art, I don't just see one dot one. I don't just hear one note. When I hear music, there's often a lot more stuff going on with it. I mean, you could hear just one note, but often it's the case. There's more, but all three are circular. All right. All three are circular. And whoop, Western music, um, as I stated before, moves around musical themes. And, and when you think about musical themes, just think about melody. That's what I, I am talking about when I talk about musical themes. And if you're like, well, I don't think it really moves around musical themes. I don't think it circles around that. Just do you really want to listen to, to music without a melody? That's the question. And I don't really think you do. Art has a subject. So it has a central idea, a central focus that it circles around. And the artist often tries to portray different things in relation to that idea. And now... I don't know if every other author writes like this, uh, but I believe this 
this idea of the cycla- cycla- cyclicality, man, of writing improves your writing, okay? So if, if I take those ideas from art, if I take that idea from music, I have a central idea when I write, and I'm circling around that idea over and over again, all right? And that's where we're going to pick it up tomorrow. And I'm going to be talking about my process of writing, my specific process of writing. And uh, as I stated before, if I stated this, I can't really remember. As I stated before, I think it's valuable. I think that I'm, I don't think, I, I think I've stated this in the past, but not this episode. I think that I've put in a lot of time to writing and, and I've certainly put in a lot of thought. I put, I certainly have put in a lot of time in writing, even if I'm not good at it. And, um, I think that looking at how I write and explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing, because there is a thought behind it. I'm just not writing and writing and having no thought behind how I'm writing. Uh, I think doing this is going to be valuable to you, even if you aren't necessarily a big writer. Because even if you sit down and write, uh, if you try to explain something to someone else, you can go back to this idea and, and maybe this can help you explain that idea better. So we are going to pick it up at how I write next episode. So this is going to be a two parts again. And I assumed it was going to be. And I'm. it's not going to be three. It's definitely not going to be three parts. If I have to, I'll go a little long with this episode. But it's not going to be three. But before we go, we're going to have our logical fallacy of the week. And uh, our logical fallacy of the week is reification. And what reification is, and this one I think needs a little bit more explanation, is an abstract belief of a hypothetical construct is treated as if it were concrete. And I'm going to give you an example about this. So that's what reification is. So if I um, if I have a specific idea, if I uh, if I come up with a specific idea, so if I think that there's, let's talk about Freud, I guess. Freud had ideas in relation to ego, id, superego, and Freud came up with these abstract ideas to explain how people interact with the world and how they develop within the world. Now, there is, uh, these are abstract things, but I've certainly heard people talk about them as if they're actual aspects of a person. They're concrete things within a person that's making them do things. There's not actually a little, there's not actually an ego in a person. Uh, It's just an idea to explain what's happening within a person. There's not actually a super ego. There's not actually an id. They're just ideas to explain how a person interacts in the world. These are um, impulses, their their, um, desires within a person, but they don't exist in the concrete, if that makes sense. So that is all I've got for you this week. I will be, I will, man, (coughs) I'm about to cough. I will see you next week. And by see you, I mean not see you. This is How to Write Good, as always, and I'm Daniel Poppy. See you later.